Aloha. Aloha. It is so good to be with you today. Is this microphone on? Do I have to stand in front of the pulpit when I come over here? Check, check, check. One, two. I, I think we're going to test this from time to time. We're on right here with this podium mic. So I, I told my secretary, I said, I'm going to Loma Linda Filipino Church. And she got really excited. She said, that's where my family is all at. Does anyone know Auntie Norma Galiza? Does anyone, anyone know her? Are you telling me she was lying? Oh, there's a couple in the back. Okay, good. Well, she says hello to you. And she's just so excited that I get to be here and to be able to share a word with her Filipino family today. And Pastor Manny, you told me that we got out at 12 o'clock sharp. So I just get to have closing prayer. Is that true? Okay. But he also said 30 to 40 minutes and that there was potluck. So you don't have to go home. We can still have the word and have some food afterwards. So that's good. Um, It's true. I, I switched roles about a year ago. I was a conference youth director for 17 years, and I've been serving as a conference president in Hawaii for one year. And in that time, I have managed to disappoint, oh look it, it's working, to disappoint my son. My son Jacob, he's 15 years old, and he's now taller than me. He used to come up and stand by my side and try to measure. Now I stand up next to him and I cheat just a little bit. And, uh, but, but in that one year, my son Jacob said, Dad, you used to be fun. Now you're boring. <laughs> but today we have the graduates on stage, a bunch of young people. This is my element. I love spending time with youth, young adults. And uh, so hopefully today I won't be boring and old, but that will also be enjoyable and hear the word of God today, if that'd be okay. Today we celebrate our graduates. You've all graduated a little bit different time, um, maybe from a different stage in life. Maybe you're graduating from kindergarten. Is there any kindergarten graduates here today? No, he's home with mom because she was sick. That's what I heard. Um, But we we have some eighth grade graduates, and I can't tell who's eighth grade and who's college. I don't know who became a doctor recently. I mean, everybody's just blending together. That's a gift of a conference president getting old. Everybody just looks the same. But you know what? We had eighth grade graduations, we had high school graduations, we had college graduations, and those that graduated from med school and and, and doctorate programs, this is amazing. But I have good news for you. It's not over. This is just the beginning of what's next. That might be a little bit discouraging, that might be a little bit encouraging. If you graduated from kindergarten, guess what? You have eight years of elementary school. Oh, that's an eternity. And if you've just graduated from eighth grade, you have, let's see, uh, four years of high school coming up. Pretty exciting, pretty intimidating. And if you just graduated high school, you have college. And if you just graduated college, maybe you're going to go on to med school or the rest of your life. You see, the thing that we just graduated from is the thing that actually prepares us for what's coming. It's the thing that's next. And we have no idea what's coming, but I promise you this, it will be exciting. Exciting times are ahead. And, you know, throughout those times, I'm guessing that you maybe asked yourself the question, am I going to make it? Were you, did you ever find yourself there? You're like, I have no idea how I'm going to get past this test. I have no idea how I'm going to pass these, these, these boards. I have no idea if I'm going to prescribe the right medication. Maybe you didn't know that. Hopefully you knew that. But where we've spent our time is the thing that just prepares us for what's coming. And as we went through these stages of life, it maybe took a little bit of faith to get us through. And you see, faith is the thing that we don't graduate from. Faith faith is the thing that we grow in. And it helps establish us for what is coming next. Faith is what's needed when we can't see past the experience that is currently in front of us. And faith is something that God gives us to help see us through. We're going to be talking about faith today. The sermon title is called Freedom Through Faith. 
And the story picks up in Luke chapter 5, verse 17. It's about a man who is in need, and this is how the story goes. It says, now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and there were teachers of the law sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up to the housetop and let him down through the roof on his bed. They pulled the tiles apart and placed him in the midst of Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said to him, man, your sins be forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this who speaks blasphemous things? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered them and said, why are you reasoning so in your hearts? Which is easier to say your sins be forgiven you or rise up and walk? But that you might know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to them, to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed. They glorified God and they were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things here today. Have you ever found yourself in a place of need before? A place where you knew that it was going to take a miracle and that if God did not intervene, your, my, your life itself might even be over? It was 2017 and I was um, taking care of the house, getting ready for Sabbath. It was a Friday afternoon. And a good friend of mine, Pastor Jesse Seibel, some of you might know, he had been the youth director previously in, in Hawaii. He said, Eric, I'm on the mainland. And um, I was loaning my vehicle to one of my friends and it broke down. It seems like it can't hold a charge. We replaced the battery. It still is dying. Is there any way that you can help? Now, he knew that I was a mechanic right after high school. Um, I knew that if you were going to fly airplanes and be a missionary pilot, it'd be a good idea to learn how to work on airplanes. And so I went and took airplane mechanics right out of high school. And it's, it's proven to be very useful as a conference youth director. Young people always seem to be breaking down in their cars and I can go and help them. And uh, so I, I went and I said, sure, I'll take a look at this, this Toyota 4Runner. I said, it's probably your alternator. Let me take care of that for you. So I replaced the alternator on his 4Runner and sure enough, that was a fix. But as I was driving the car, I noticed that the indicator that showed what gear you were in also didn't line up with the indicator on the gear shifter. So I was in the driveway, I, I was kind of parked in a steep hill right outside my house and um, I just crawled underneath the 4Runner and I did something you should never do. I reached up and I touched the linkage between the gear shifter and the transmission. And as I lightly touched it, the vehicle popped out of park and the vehicle started coming down the hill and I was wedged between the tire and the ground. And the vehicle is starting to slide down slowly as my body is getting wedged between the tire and the concrete and my skin is starting to get pinched and ground into the concrete. The weight of this vehicle is crushing me. It wasn't on jacks. It was just the weight of this vehicle and the tire pressing upon my body. I didn't have much breath in my lungs. And I knew that I was in a place of need where that if somebody did not help me in the very next few moments, my life itself would cease to exist. I had just enough air to yell out to my wife. I said, Jana, help. Has anyone ever called to their spouse before? And do they naturally just come running at your beck and call? <laughs> my wife was in the house cleaning. It was a Friday afternoon. Christian music was playing, you know, the good stuff that keeps you motivated to, to clean the house. Not only did I cry out to my wife, I cried out to my God. I said, God, save me. Save me. My wife comes running out. That in itself was a miracle. 
She comes running out and she says, Eric, what do I do? What do I do? She was full of panic and fear. And I had to choose my words carefully because I only had so much air in my lungs. And I said, get it off with emphasis, exclamation point. Get it off. She said, how? She gets into the car and she tries to start it, but everybody knows that if a car is not in park or in neutral, it's not going to start. But she didn't know it had popped out of park. So she gets out of the car because she can't get it started and she walks down to the bottom of the vehicle and she thinks that she's going to have huper sumen strength and push this vehicle uphill. And I see her feet and her legs and my wife is not super strong and super tall and, you know, and I thought, I'm dead. I said, I'm going I'm to die. There's no way she's pushing this 5,000 pound vehicle up a hill. You know, and even if she can get it a couple inches, she's going to let it go and it's just going to keep crushing me. <laughs> and so my prayer changed from God save me to I'll see you soon. At complete, ple- complete peace. You know, they say your life flashes before your eyes. It had. And I saw all the memories, the times flying airplanes in Venezuela and pulling sick people out of the jungles. The times knocking on doors with young people and connecting them to a savior. The times at summer camp where decisions were being made for Jesus on Friday night altar calls. The baptisms in the swimming pool had lived a good life. And I said, you know what, Jesus, I'll see you soon. Have you ever found your place, yourself in a place of need where you knew that if God did not work a miracle, it was over? You see, that's where this paralytic was. He was lying in his bed, condemned and sentenced to death. There was nothing left for him, Pastor Manny. He had been to the temple over and over again. He had sought help from the Pharisees, the teachers of the law. Will God's grace save me? And he was always turned away. Because you see, the religious leaders taught that if you were sick, It was because something you did in your life, there was some sin that you hadn't confessed. And this was God's divine displeasure playing out in your life and in your body. There is nothing left for you. Go home and die. He had been to the doctors. There was no hope. So he was laying in his bed, overcome with shame, with guilt, with condemnation, rejection from the religious leaders, and ultimately rejection from God. But then his friends showed up. His friends showed up, and they started to tell him stories about a man named Jesus. He was a miracle worker. He had raised the dead. He had caused the blind to see. He would even cleansed lepers. And hope started to fill this man's life. Hope. And on this day, his friends came to him. They said, listen, Jesus is in town. Jesus is here. Maybe Jesus has a miracle for you. And so these men pick him up in his bed and they take him to Peter's house where the crowds have been forming. You see, the crowds had come from all over. They come from Judea, from Galilee, from Jerusalem. They came to see Jesus, some to see a miracle, others to condemn But the crowd was too great and they could not get him in. What would they do? And then somebody had an idea. If we can't get to Jesus through the door, maybe we can get to Jesus some other way. They don't give up. And instead, they go up onto the roof and they started to peel back the tiles. Have you ever seen your roof just open up a skylight? Imagine if all of a sudden we started to see this roof coming apart. I've seen it happen once. It was at Camp Winai when we were tearing the roof off because we needed to replace that. But I can imagine these tiles are starting to be peeled apart and the dust and the crumbs start to fall and people start wondering what in the world is going on. And then all of a sudden they see some faces up on the roof. And before long, there's this man that's coming down, being lowered down and placed at the feet of Jesus. This had never been done before. 
But the friends did something amazing. They didn't know how to bring healing into their friend's life, but they knew who to take him to. The best thing possible, they place him at the feet of Jesus. Everybody's eyes is on Jesus. What is he going to do? What is he going to say? And the religious leaders, of course, they were fully engaged because they had known this man. They had seen him. They had seen him at the temple. They had turned him away and rejected him. What is Jesus going to do? Is he going to uphold the law? Or is he once again going to push the limits? And when Jesus sees him, he has compassion on this man. He has compassion on him. And he does the unthinkable. He says, son, be of good cheer. Son, be of good cheer. What in the world? Why would you ever call a sinner a son? He's the outcast. He's the one that's been rejected by God. Why would you ever call him a son? And Jesus now takes it a step further. He says, son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. What? Your sins be forgiven you. And we take a pause for a moment in this story and we ask ourselves the question, why would Jesus do this? Why would Jesus do this? I believe the answer is found in verse 20. It says this, when he saw their faith, he said to him, did you notice that? It wasn't the faith of the paralytic. So many times we think that the miracle is dependent on our faith. But in this story, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, son, be of good cheer. Did you know that your faith has the ability to make somebody else whole when connected to the creator of the universe? This is amazing. This now gives us access to something that we didn't even know possible. Our faith has the ability to connect with somebody else's life and with the source of strength, Jesus Christ. And when we pull them together, miracles take place. It was a few years ago. Um, I believe it was, was summer of 2018. Maybe it was 19. And the lava started to flow on the Big Island. Did anyone see any of those pictures of the volcano on the Big Island in, in, in Hilo. Did you guys see that? The lava was flowing, and, and it's the most intense, slow pace adrenaline you can ever have. I actually went up to the lava and was standing only feet, feet away from this lava as it's flowing just so ever slowly. One of the church members, he was a lifeguard, and he had access to places that you weren't supposed to have access to. And at, at 2 in the morning with a bunch of young adults, we're hiking up into these lava fields, and we see the ground separating, and there's cracks of lava and you said, this is intense. But this lava started ripping through communities, devastating homes, and people were, were leaving and they were going and living in the shelters. When the shelters were, were too full, they would go and they would live in the parks. And I thought, man, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? This was just a week or two from summer camp happening. And the thought came to me, use what you have. Well, I don't have a lot, but I do have a summer camp. Yeah, but those kids are on another island. How are you going to get them to camp? But the thought, once again, led by the Spirit of God, use what you have. And so I called up the pastor. I said, Pastor Renee, listen, I know that your church members are going into these, these um, shelters and they're feeding people at four in the morning. They're starting to make the food. If there's anybody who's willing to send their kids to summer camp, let us know, we'll send them. He said, oh, thank you so much. He says, oh, these shelters are overflowing and, and the air quality is just terrible. It's just terrible. And these kids are waking up at night and they're just, some of them are screaming because they think that Pele, the, the volcano god, is gonna take their parents. The conditions are terrible. They, some of these children have woken up to see people who have hung themselves because they can't afford to start over. Their businesses destroyed, their homes destroyed. And so I said, okay, whoever is willing to send kids to camp, we'll sponsor them. We'll, we'll send them to summer camp. Pastor Renee said, hey, I've got, I've got a couple of kids. I said, all right, that's great. Send them. Call me a few days later. Hey, we now have 10 kids that are going to come. 
That's wonderful. Then he said 15, 20, 25. Oh, man, these numbers are starting to get big. I don't know if we have money to fly all these kids over and to send them to summer camp. At the end, we had over 50 kids, 52 kids who came to summer camp who had no connection to God or church, but they're now coming to summer camp. One of these young men, his, his, he was 10 years old at the time. His name was Makoa. And uh, Makoa was a handful. Makoa was the type of kid who, when you'd tell him to walk in a straight line, he'd walk back and forth and zigzag or walk in circles. When you'd tell him to say kind words, he'd use bad words. When, when uh, you were saying be nice to the girls, he'd be the one pulling their hair or kicking them. He wouldn't be listening to his counselor. Makoa was a handful. And finally, Makoa had had enough. He didn't want to follow the rules. And it was about 10 o'clock at night. And, and, and I remember that he had grabbed his suitcase. And he said, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And he started walking down the road. And if you've ever been to Camp Waianae, we have a cafeteria. And I was standing at the cafeteria door because I knew that it was coming. As a good camp director, you're always monitoring what's going on from a distance. And as he walks by the door, I walk out and stand beside him. And I start walking next to Makoa. And we start walking down the road. There's a dumpster. And then the, the road turns. And where the road turns, there's a bunch of cars on the side. And he stops for a moment and he says, aren't we going to take one of the cars? We have to go to the airport. I said, no. Well, how are we going to get there? I don't know. And we start walking down that driveway. And the wonderful thing about Camp Waianae is it's in the middle of nowhere. And it's 10 p.m. at night and it's pitch black. It's pitch black. And there were scary sounds coming from the woods. Little animals that come out at night. Of course, nothing in Hawaii is harmful. But Makoa doesn't know that. And he stops in the middle of the driveway and he starts to cry. And then in this choked up voice, he says, I, I want to go back. And I said, Makoa, we can go back. But before we go back, do you think that we could just sit here for a moment and talk story? Tell me about yourself. And so as I'm talking to Makoa in the middle of the driveway, he starts telling me about when he was two or three years old, his dad was a, was a, a contractor and he had been pouring concrete all day and he decided to go jump into the ocean and wash all the concrete off. And as he jumps into the ocean, a big wave hits him and smashes him up against a rock wall and it knocks him out and he ends up drowning and he dies. You see, everything that this little boy had, had, had grown to love was ripped away. The security was now gone. This little boy was experiencing pain in his life that he should never have had to experience growing up now without a father. And you could see it playing out in his life, a life that was filled with pain and with hurt. And I asked Makoa, I said, Makoa, have you, do you know much about God? He said, no. Have you ever been to, to church, Makoa? No, I've never been to church. I said, well, let me tell you a story. And kneeling there in the driveway, I got to tell Makoa a story about how God created this world perfect, how there was no, more, no sin, there was no suffering, but then we chose to distrust God and sin entered into the world. And God says, listen, I can't have a world full of sin where life is destroyed and death is what remains. And so he sends his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to give himself for us as a sacrifice to restore that which was lost. And I said, Makoa, did you know that when you give your life to Jesus, death is not the end? Did you know that, that if you give your life to Jesus, there's a good possibility that you might be able to see your dad again someday? This is the first time Makoa had ever heard the good news. This is the first time he had ever heard the story. This is the first time that he ever heard that there was life beyond the grave and that he might be able to get to see his father again someday. I said, Makoa, would you like to give your life to Jesus? And he looked at me with a look where you know that he wants to, but he doesn't know how. And I said, Makoa, 
would you like me to help you? And he said, yes. Right there in the middle of the driveway, a little boy giving his life to Jesus for the first time. Did you know that your faith has the ability to make somebody whole? You see, when we have faith, we grab onto the hand of our father and we stretch our hand out to the child and we pull them together, the faith at work, and we place them in the hands of the master and a miracle takes place. You see, that was what was happening with this paralytic who was laying on his bed. It was the faith of his friends that placed him at the feet of the master, Jesus Christ, the one who could give life. And Jesus says, son, be of good cheer. Your sins be forgiven you. I'm wondering if today somebody needs to hear those words. Does someone need to hear those same words, the words from Jesus, son, daughter, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. You have a handout in your bulletin. Sometimes you like to take notes. I kind of forgot about it. The first one, did you know that your faith can make somebody whole? The second one, today, I can be free from blank. What is it that you need to be free from? Is it, is it the weight of a past that continues to haunt you? Romans 6, I love Romans 6. Romans 6 says something amazing. Romans 6, verse 3, it says, Or do you not know that as many of you who were baptized into Christ Jesus were also baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also should be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Today, Jesus offers you freedom from sin. Because if you participated in baptism, symbolizing the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that freedom is for you today. You are a son. You are a daughter of the living God who has set you free from sin because of his death and his resurrection. Today, you can be set free. But you know, there will always be those who want to remind you of your past. You notice that? We see that in the life of the Pharisees. Verse 21, it says, And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemous things? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But I love what Jesus does because he perceives what's going on in their minds. He perceives what's going on in their hearts. And he says this, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, Your sins be forgiven you or rise up and walk? I mean, which one's easier? Is it easier to say something or to do something? something? It's easier to say something, right? How many of you have talked big before at school? And then you got to go back it up and you're like, man, why in the world did I ever say that? Why in the world did I ever say that? <laughs> but Jesus is like, aha, check this out. Check this out. And the scribes and the Pharisees are like, man, we have finally got them. Because you know what? Here's the deal. Jesus said your sins are forgiven you. But guess what you're doing? You're still lying in this bed. That's the evidence. That's the evidence that you do not have the power. Only God has the power, and he is still lying here in this bed. And so what Jesus does is he does something amazing. Because of the, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, because of their unbelief, he says this. He says, so that all might know, I say to you, rise up and walk. Rise up and walk. And so this man, he rises up from his bed and he walks past the people who wanted to keep him in the bed full of sin. He rises up and he walks out. Jesus works the miracle because of the unbelief, the people who are in the church who want to keep him in slavery. 
I'm wondering today, is there somebody in our lives that God has set free, but we don't want to recognize the miracle that has taken place? Is there somebody that's in our life that we need to set free? Somebody that's maybe wronged us. Somebody that didn't treat us well. Somebody who maybe stole away our spouse. Somebody who maybe we saw do some things in church that should not be done. Today, Jesus is saying, set them free. Because who the Son sets free is free indeed. I think about the story of Pharaoh. God had set his people free. Pharaoh just didn't want to recognize it. God continued to show Pharaoh over and over and over that his people had been set free and that he should let them go. But even after Pharaoh let the people go, he held on so tightly that he pursued the people of God who had been set free. And in the end, it cost him his own life. Brothers and sisters, I want to let you know today, if God has set somebody free and you're not willing to recognize it, it might cost you your life. It might cost you your salvation. Do not hold on. Set them free. This man in Desire of Ages, page 268, says this. After Jesus has spoken the word to freedom, it says, the burden of despair rolls from the sick man's soul. The peace of forgiveness rests upon his spirit and shines out upon his countenance. His physical pain is gone and the whole being is transformed. The helpless paralytic is healed. The guilty sinner has been pardoned. You see, it was just enough for him to hear those words. Son, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. We need to recognize that God is in the business of healing people. God is in the business of setting the captive free. And I'm so glad that this man was willing to believe the words that Jesus spoke. Something else interesting takes place after he walks past all of those people that had tried to keep him from Jesus. In verse 25, it says, immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been laying on, and he departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things here today. You know, it's amazing when we recognize that God has worked a miracle. Something amazing takes place. And we see it actually, what what had been said in verse 17 at the beginning of the story. It says this, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. In the story, we only see one person that gets healing, but it says the spirit was there to heal them. You see, the miracles are not just for the individual, but it's for the entire body. When we recognize that God does something in somebody's life, it causes us to have healing take place in our lives because we recognize the goodness of God. It starts to build faith in us and we start to see that we can trust our heavenly father. The miracles are not just for the individual who experiences it, but it's for everybody. Faith requires three things in order to take place. Faith requires that I believe the word that is spoken. It's not enough for the paralytic just to hear the word. He actually has to believe the words that Jesus speaks The second thing that has to take faith requires is that we now have to move in the direction of the belief. The paralytic can't just hear the words and believe them. He actually now needs to move in the direction of the belief. He believes that the words of Jesus are true. And so now he starts to move and life flows into his body as he stands up and he walks out. The last thing that faith requires is that we have to expect that something takes place. We have to believe the word. We have to move in the direction of the belief. And then we have to expect great results. Because when Jesus says it, the word is true. There is no place for doubt in the life of a Christian. There is no place for doubt in the life of a Christian. I wonder how your faith is today. Is your faith strong? Is it weak? Is it something that is active? Is it it something that is impacting the communities in which we live? 
Faith is something that God gives to each one of us so that not only will we move forward in our relationship with him, but also in the lives of the people we come in contact with. God is wanting you to experience a deep faith with him today. Even if it's the size of a grain of mustard seed, it can still move mountains. Jesus came to set the captive free. He says in Isaiah 65, 24, he says, Before they call on me, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear them. Our faith is not something that is just for here and now, but it's something that will last for eternity. And as we go out and we declare the everlasting gospel to the other worlds and to the other nations, we will be able to let our faith be active and it will continue to grow as we experience the goodness of our Father. There are many times in this world where we enter into dark places. And when we're in those dark places, we need to remember what we saw in the light. We need to remember that we serve a good Father. We need to remember that He has a plan for us and that someday soon He is coming to take us home. Because this is not the end. This is not the end. Jesus says in the final words, he's coming to make all things new, where there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more fear. The former things are gone. And in Revelation 22, he says, behold, I come quickly. Salvation is something that took place at the beginning of the foundation of the world. Salvation is something that took place when Jesus came into this world. Salvation is something that will come in the end. But salvation is also for us now. And as I was laying on the ground, underneath this car, being crushed, my wife goes back into the vehicle. And she starts to pray and says, God, what do I do? What do I do? Three months earlier, I was out working at the summer camp. I was working at the summer camp. And my wife calls me and she says, hey, Eric, um, I don't know what to do. The car won't start. I'm at the grocery store. Can you come help? I said, no, I'm, I'm over an hour away. You're going to have to call AAA. And she calls AAA and the tow truck comes. The tow truck comes. And they try to jumpstart the car and it won't start. And the tow truck driver says, hey, you just forgot to put it in park. <laughs> she says, oh, dumb. She puts the car in park and she starts the car. And as she's now sitting three months later, she's sitting in the, in the car. Her eyes glance down at the gear shift lever and she sees that it's not in park. She throws it into park. She starts the car and she drives it off of me. You see, God answers before we even ask. Three months earlier, he had given her the solution. I'm gasping for air. I call 911 on my cell phone, telling them the address and where I'm at. I ended up having 17 fractures in my ribs. My lungs were ruptured, a broken scapula. I was bleeding profusely from my forehead. But I was still alive. I had faith in a father who was good, a faith in a father who was good, not knowing the end, but being confident whether I died right there in the driveway or whether I rose for another day, my faith was still grounded in him who saves. Salvation comes at the beginning, it comes in the middle, and it comes at the end. Jesus is here to save. He is our redeemer, and we get to have faith in him. And our faith is not just for ourselves, but it's for those in our community and who we serve. Let your light so shine before men that a city on a hill cannot be hidden, that others can see your good works, graduates. God has not called you just for the present time, for the here and now. He's called you to be lights in a dark world because this is not the end. This is just a temporary dash in eternity. God has a purpose. He has a plan for your life, and that's to connect others to him. Father God, thank you for being a good father, one who loves us, one who cares for us, one who sees us in our darkest moments when we're lying in need on a bed, paralyzed, committed to death. Thank you, Father, for those that you've surrounded us with who live by faith and not by sight. 
And Lord, when we experience your faith, Lord, it's something that we get to share with others and in our communities to make a difference in a dark world. May we remember that this is not our home, that you're a good father, and that someday soon you're coming to take us home. May we be found ready and be surrounded by the friends that you have entrusted at us to connect them to you. We pray all these things in your holy name. Amen.